Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. Today we're in Nehemiah chapter 7. We'll begin in verse 1. While you're getting your Bible, I hope, I will remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. I won't even mention this, but it's important because it's all the Word of God, just like this broadcast, just like Scripture Verse by Verse has been for over 30 years. Nothing but the Word of God, verse by verse, from Genesis through Revelation. Three complete series are archived for you at the Bible verse by verse dot com. That's the scripture verse by verse website where you can study the entire Bible at your pace and your convenience using my audio Bible messages, just like we're going to do today, at the Bible verse by verse dot com. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 1. And it says, Now it came to pass, when the wall was built, and of course that's talking about the wall that surrounded the city of Jerusalem. The exiles returned with Ezra, and they rebuilt the temple. Then Nehemiah was instructed to go back and rebuild the city, especially the walls of Jerusalem, which had been knocked down years earlier, along with the temple by Babylon when they conquered Israel. So it says, now it came to pass when the wall was built, and I had set up the doors, and the porters, and the singers, and the Levites were appointed, that I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. Nehemiah turned the leadership of Jerusalem over to two men who had the deepest respect for God. And there's a lesson for us there. If a person doesn't respect the Lord, they're not fit to lead. I don't think a person who, res who doesn't respect the Lord should be trusted in positions of leadership. There may be exceptions, but if you have an ungodly man who doesn't care about God, what makes you think he's going to care about doing what is right? Like I said, there may be exceptions, but as a general rule, and especially when you look to qualifications for leaders in the Word of God, it's always, it's always the same. Whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, it's not their skills, it's not their education, it's not their financial state status, it's none of that stuff. It's, are they righteous? That's what God cares about. That's who we should look to for leadership. Verse 3, And I said unto them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun be hot. And while they stand by, let them shut the doors and bar them, and appoint guards over the inhabitants of Jerusalem, everyone in his watch, and everyone opposite his own house. In other words, the security of Jerusalem should be the top priority of the leadership. If a people are not safe, nothing else matters much. Verse 4. Now the city was large and great, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not built. Nehemiah built the walls where they had once been, even though there was only a, a fraction of the number of people who were once there in Jerusalem. Nehemiah built those walls 
with a view to the future, a future he trusted would be blessed by God, and that meant a larger population. Verse 5, And my God put into mine heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And I found a registration of the genealogy of them who came up at the first and found written in it. Let's stop there for a second. The plan was to repopulate the city with people who could prove that they were Jews. That's the reason for the genealogies. And verses 6 through 69 contain that register, that list of all the people. So let's go down to verse 70, and without reading that, I'll just say 70 through 72 contain the donations that the people gave. So verse 73, so the priests and the Levites and the porters and the singers and some of the people and the Nethanim and all Israel dwelt in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. All is well as this chapter closes. The cities of Israel are populated and they are secure. Chapter 8. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. City squares were usually located near the gate. And this is where the people assembled, right here, to hear the word of God. Verse 2, I love this. And Ezra the priest brought the law, brought the word of God, before the congregation, both of men and women, and all who could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. So it is actually October 8th, 445 B.C. It's New Year's Day, according to the Jewish calendar. Verse 3. And he read from it facing the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. So for five or six hours, the people stood and listened to the word of God. Verse 4, and Ezra, and Ezra the scribe, stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mathaniah, and Shema, and Anana, and Uriah, and Hilkiah, and Masiah on his right hand and on his left hand, Pedaah and Mishael and Malachijah and Heshem and Heshbadna, Zechariah and Meshulam. Let's continue reading in verse 5. And Ezra opened the book, in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. I just love this. Out of respect for God's word, the people stood while it was read. Verse 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, 
lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So Ezra begins this service with prayer and with worship, and the people join them. Seven, also Jeshua and Bani and Sheribiah, Jamin, Akub, Shab, Bethe, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanum, Pelilah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. And notice verse 8. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. You see, this is where I got my idea. This is where, this is the verse, at least one of the verses, the big verse, I would say, that God used to get me to start Scripture verse by verse well over 30 years ago. This is exactly what they did. The Word of God was taught verse by verse. It was read, and then the sense of it was explained. And that is what I have tried to do for over 30 years. I never, never studied the Word of God for a sermon. I study the Word of God verse by verse, just as I teach it, and then I read it to you and give the sense of it. That's exactly what Ezra and company did on this day. And that's what I've been doing. And I figure that's the way to do it. And I figure the best way to do it is from Genesis through Revelation. The whole counsel of God, verse by verse. I know, you know, you go to some Bible colleges and preaching school, whatever you want to call it, and I've, and I've heard people say this. Well, we teach our men to preach the Word of God, you know, and we teach them to have a three-point outline with an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying I don't understand why. I don't understand why. why. Why would I even think about doing that when all of the Word of God has been given to us by God verse by verse? Why not simply give it back verse by verse the way God gave it and the way Ezra did it? He did it. He didn't figure out an outline. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying this is why I do what I do. And I believe God blesses it because it's his word, of course. And his word does not come back to him empty. I don't have to figure out some concocted outline. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to limit the verses of God's word to some outline that I came up with? Why don't I just read the word of God and then give the sense of it and let the Holy Spirit take it and apply it to your life and show you what it means? So... Here you have it. This is, this is the verse that gave birth to Scripture verse by verse over 30 years ago, for what it's worth. Verse 10. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. See? Look what happened. The, what, no, look, let's back up and read verse 9. I, I skipped that. And it's an important one. How could I skip this? And Nehemiah, who is in Tur Shatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. More not nor weep, for all the people wept 
when they heard the words of the law. The people wept as they heard God's law. So much for the idea that it is the job of a preacher to make everybody feel good. (laughs) No, it's to communicate the word of God clearly. And if it makes you happy, then be happy. And if it makes you sad, well, there's there's some reason that you're sad when you hear the word of God, okay? So they wept when they heard God's law. They're just now coming out of some very difficult times because their fathers did not keep the law of God. And they saw firsthand, and they heard firsthand what happens when people don't do that, what the Word of God says, what Ezra and the others were, t- were reading and teaching. They've seen the results of not keeping it, and maybe they weren't keeping it the way they should. So they were crying. Hey, hey God plays hardball. He means business. His Word is His Word, isn't it? See? That's why it needs to be taught verse by verse. Do you see that? That's why it has to be taught verse by verse. The whole counsel of God. Some parts are going to make you happy. Some parts are going to fill you with joy. Some parts are going to keep you sad. Some parts are going to make you sorrowful. Some parts are going to make you weep. Some parts are going to make you feel guilty. Some parts are going to make you rejoice and shout. It all depends on where you're at in light of the Word of God at that particular moment. And then the Holy Spirit deals with you, see, according to what the Word of God says, and you respond correctly when you respond in the Holy Spirit. And then things are better as a result. But it all starts with giving out the whole counsel of God. And yeah, that means even Nehemiah and Ezra, which, to be frank with you, I like Nehemiah better than Ezra, but that doesn't matter. Some people are blessed by Reza. Some people are blessed by Nehemiah. Some people are blessed by Song of Solomon. I mean, that's fine. I guess it all depends where we're at, but it's all important. Feelings are not important. Well, verse 10, again, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink. It's the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared for this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The poor who couldn't afford food and drink were never to be left out of these celebrations before God. Verse 11. So the Levites stilled all the people saying, hold your peace for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went to their went their, to their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Isn't that nice? The people were happy after they, they were taught the Word of God. And yes, in some cases, initially, the Word of God made them sad, which is understandable. But then you respond to it correctly and make the corrections that are needed, that are showed you by God in the Word of God, that make you sad. And then after you respond correctly, then you start feeling good. And that's why it's important to teach the entire counsel of God, even even the parts that aren't going to make you feel too good. You know, if I preach on hell, there's a lot of preachers, a lot of pastors, in modern evangelicalism, if they ever talked about hell, the people in their congregation would sit there and scratch their heads completely and totally bewildered because they never heard about it. They never heard that preacher talk about it. Years and years they've been sitting in that same church in those pews and they never once heard anybody mention hell because it's too negative. If some In some churches, if a pastor preached on hell, talked about hell, he would have to explain what it is and what it's like, because the people wouldn't know. That's shameful. Shameful, simply because people don't want to hear it. You preach on hell 
Because if there's a lost soul sitting in that audience, maybe, just maybe, if they find out that they're going to go to that place, that horrible place, they will feel horrible, like Ezra's listeners did. They will feel horrible, and that they could be told how to take away those feelings, those terrible feelings, by repenting and receiving Christ. But you don't get to that point if the Word of God isn't taught, even the unpleasant part. So they did it right here. And in the end, the people made the corrections, and they feel fine. See? See? And so some people say, well, you're, you're unloving, Moret, because you talk about these things. No, I'm not. Then so was Ezra, and so was Nehemiah. And so was Jesus, because he talked about hell more than he did heaven. He talked more about hell than everyone else in the New Testament combined. Did you know that? So don't tell me I'm unloving, unless you're willing to say that Jesus is unloving. My goodness. Verse 13. And on the second day, we're gathered together, the heads of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. Another day of verse-by-verse -verse Bible teaching. Here we go. Stick with it. It's right. It works. God uses it. So there they go again. And verse 14, And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths, in the feast of the seventh month, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booths, as it is written. Well, they discovered something else from the word of God, didn't they? There were some there was a religious feast in the seventh month. Passover, remember, was in the first month. In the seventh month there was another one, the Feast of Booths. And they were supposed to use, among other things, olive branches. Of course, olive trees were all over the place in that country. Sixteen. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, everyone upon the roof of his house and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and in the street of the water gate, and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. And all the congregation of them who were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, that's Moses, the guy who took over for Moses. Since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, unto that day, had not the children of Israel done so? And there was a very great gladness. Do you, do you realize how long it had been? Centuries. The Feast of Booths had been celebrated. But before this, but not with the level of excitement and zeal for God that it was celebrated at this time, not since the days of Joshua. Verse 18. Also day by day, from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the ordinance. The word of God, notice this, verse by verse, was the highlight of each one of those days. Boy, they had their act together, didn't they? Chapter 9. Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with earth upon them. The people were sad and sorry for their sins. They're ready to pray to God for forgiveness. See, that's another result of teaching the word of God verse by verse. Every verse of the Bible. Because God will meet you exactly where you are. And if you listen and your heart is open to truth, 
the Holy Spirit will tell you what you need to know. And if you're doing something wrong, whatever verse you might be listening to will grab a hold of you. If it's taught straight and clearly, the Holy Spirit will use you, use it, and you will feel guilt if you need to feel guilt. And that's what happened here. And the people were sorry. They're going to pray to God for forgiveness. And notice verse 2. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. They confessed their sins and they were so sorry that they even confessed the sins of their fathers. And they also cut off relations with people who clearly didn't want anything to do with God. And all these things, they learned, they were taught from the Word of God by the Holy Spirit when it was taught to them clearly, when it was read to them, and the sense was given. Verse 3, And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord, their God, one fourth part of the day, and another fourth part they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. I, I just love this. This is great. They listened to the word of God for three hours and then they confessed their sins and worshiped God for three hours. It sounds like a, a worship service that I used to conduct. I did it every Saturday evening for two years. And uh, there were people, as there, were, there were people from, I wasn't pastor in a church or anything, but there were people from in this one particular town from many different churches and many different denominations. And all these people had one thing in common. They loved God and they loved to worship God and they wanted to hear the word of God taught. So I would go to that town and there was, there was a church that let us use their basement. And so every Saturday for two years, I would go there and we would worship God. We had worship. We would worship for, for an hour. And then we would, and then we would, uh, I would teach the word of God for an hour. And then we would pray for an hour. And that's what we did. Three hour service. Hour of worship, hour of me teaching verse by verse, and then an hour of prayer. It was great. It was great because the people weren't getting that in their churches. They weren't getting the word of God like they wanted. They weren't getting worship like they wanted. And they weren't, they, they weren't able to pray like they wanted to. So all these different people, God's people from all these different churches and denominations came and we got together and did that. It's sort of like what was happening here. Of course, there wasn't any denominations or anything, but still, that's what they were doing. We're going to stop right here for today. We'll pick it up in verse 4 next time. I, just a reminder that you can continue studying the Word of God verse by verse, just like Ezra did it, at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study at your pace, at your convenience. All you have to do is bring your Bible. That's all you need. Bring your Bible and have it opened to whatever book you want to study, whatever chapter, and then click on that book and click on that chapter in either Scripture Verse by Verse Series 1, 2, or 3, and listen and study the whole Bible, verse by verse. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, remember we, brought, we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. Stand with this ministry. If you are blessed by the Word of God, then prove it by taking a stand with me and helping me to get out the Word of God. Because for over 30 years, this ministry has never changed. Never. I have done it the same way all the time, every week for over 30 years. And I have never been underwritten by a large church or denomination. Never. It's always been a faith ministry where I just give out the Word of God as Ezra did and give the sense of it like he did and trust that God's people who are blessed like the Israelites were to give and help me to give out the Word of God. And you can't. Just click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com. Until next time, so long, everyone.